We're also making an Anki deck and we'll be sharing the slides for this video. So go ahead and look for those in the description. Starting off with some basic terminology or dermatology, the terminology we use in dermatology. These are really essential for guiding your differential diagnosis and describing the morphology of lesions that you see. And importantly, different primary lesions and secondary uh, characteristics can really help you hone in and determine uh, what category of condition or lesion that you're looking at, which can guide your diagnosis. For example, we have uh, several primary lesions that are very important to know. So a flat lesion that's less than one centimeter in diameter is called a macule. That could be something like a freckle or a lentigo. A flat lesion that's greater than one centimeter in diameter is a patch. An elevated lesion that's less than one centimeter in diameter is called a papule. And an elevated domed lesion that's greater than one centimeter in diameter is called a nodule. An elevated flat lesion that's greater than one centimeter uh, but is flat is not called a nodule but is instead called a plaque. And that's kind of the counterpart to a patch, right? Because a patch is a flat lesion greater than one centimeter in diameter, whereas uh, a plaque is an elevated flat lesion that's greater than one centimeter in diameter. So really the difference in elevation can uh, also determine what your primary lesion is. And the way to tell if a lesion is elevated or not is if you close your eyes and run your hand over the lesion, if you're able to feel an elevation, then the lesion is elevated, which would make it either a papule, nodule, or plaque. Uh, a blister less than one centimeter in diameter may be filled with clear fluid. That's a vesicle, so you can see that in your uh, herpes family infections like HSV, shingles, which is VZV. A blister that's greater than one centimeter in diameter filled with clear fluid is called a bulla. So you can see this in some of your aminobullous diseases like bullus pemphigoid, uh, pemphigus vulgaris. A pus filled blister is called a pustule. And a smooth transient pink elevated lesion, uh, this is a wheel or can be see, which can be seen in urticaria. This is also called hives. Denudation of the epidermis, maybe seen after a scrape or something like that, is called an erosion. And then denudation of the dermis, which is, which means it's a deeper scrape or something like that, is called an ulcer. So an erosion is really just a surface layer of the skin, the epidermis, whereas uh, an ulcer involves denudation of both the epidermis and the dermis, which is deeper. Some secondary descriptors that we use include uh, flaking of the stratum corneum, which is called scaling, which can be seen in psoriasis or tinea. And this is, can really be a good example of what we were just talking about earlier with this slide, in that using primary lesions and secondary descriptors can really help you key into a family of diagnoses. For example, if I told you there was a three to four centimeter elevated erythematous plaque with an adherent silvery scale, you would be thinking of a certain family of uh, diagnoses, right? And we can put a name on that family actually and call it a papule squamous conditions, meaning these are conditions with like a papule or plaque with an overlying scale. And within this family, we have things like psoriasis, which is most consistent with the description I gave, also tinea infection or eczema as well. So that's how you can use your primary lesions and secondary descriptors to uh, give your reader or give a good idea of what you're looking at. And then using other clues from the history or the morphology uh, or chart review, you can determine what diagnoses are more or less likely, just like in other fields, and really hone in on your differential diagnosis. So a dried exudate, this can either be blood, which would be called a hemorrhagic exudate, or uh, can be serous, it's called a crust, so you can have a hemorrhagic crust or a serous crust. Uh, thickened skin from chronic irritation and scratching is called lichenification, which can be seen in chronic dermatitis or where patients are chronically scratching or, or irritating their lesions. And lichenification is named after lichen, like what you see on trees or rocks. And it really uh, is the thickened skin that you see after chronic irritation. Let's say you have a, you know a patient has known thrombocytopenia and they develop these multiple one to two millimeter uh, 
red to purple non-blanchipole lesions. These are called petechiae. And a counterpart to that is, let's say a patient develops bleeding under the skin and it's a several centimeter area of non-blanching, maybe a palpable area that's slightly elevated. That's purpura. And what non-blanching means is that normally if you were to press on, uh, on your skin, you would see the skin would turn white, right? And, uh, and that's uh, kind of the constricting of blood vessels. But if you have petechiae or purpura, it means there's extravasation of red blood cells from the blood vessels into the, the tissue. So that wouldn't blanch. And it would, your skin wouldn't turn white with compression. Uh, okay, and chronic steroid use and Cushing syndrome, or uh, this phenomenon also occurs with aging. This is atrophy and occur either in the epidermis or the dermis. And then lesions that are present after a patient has been scratching. So you may see some linear erosions. This is excoriation. So this can be a really good clinical hint that a lesion is particularly pruritic or itchy. So this is using uh, these terms, your primary lesions and your secondary descriptors, you can really develop a, a good description of what you're seeing and use that to guide, uh, guide what differentials you want to think about and what categories you want to consider. So going over some more basics of the dermatology. So we have here our epidermal layers and I have a acronym can lasagna go so bad which and the first letter of which each of these words gives you the first five layers of the epidermis so can lasagna go so bad c l g s b so that's a stratum corneum stratum lucidum which is only seen in acral skin uh, which means it's in the palms and soles only the stratum granulosum the stratum spinosum and the stratum basal or the uh, basal layer after the epidermis, we have the basement membrane, which separates and connects the epidermis and dermis. And then we have the dermis followed by the subcutaneous fat or subcutaneous tissue layer. Uh, and then just some high yield facts of some of the layers of the epidermis. So in the stratum corneum, that's com mostly comprised of keratin and typically doesn't have uh, living cells with uh, in in normal tissue in some conditions you can see nuclei in the stratum corneum and that's something called parakeratosis again the stratum lucidum is only seen in acral skin so palms and soles the stratum granulosum um, you can see changes to the stratum granulosum in some conditions like lichen planus and, and psoriasis the stratum spinosum or the spiny layer is named that way because of desmosomes that kind of, that connect the cells and are the junctions between cells in this area and this gives the layer its characteristic spiny appearance and then the basal layer contains the stem cells and also melanosomes and melanocytes and melanocytes are responsible for producing melanin which gives the skin its color and then we'll have our basement membrane followed by our dermis so derm groupings are something that I alluded to earlier in the video and basically we can use the morphology we uh, we learned in the first slide to describe the lesions we're looking at and based on that morphology kind of lump the different conditions in different categories. So starting with this first image on the bottom left we see these pretty well defined, maybe erythematous plaques. So plaques are primary lesions with this, th this thick adherent scale overlying it. So this makes me think of the papulosquamous category of diagnoses, which basically involve lesions with papules and plaques uh, with overlying scale. So that can involve things like psoriasis, atopic dermatitis, tinea infection, seborrheic dermatitis, fixed drug, er drug eruptions, pityriasis rosea, and secondary syphilis. And next we have our, uh, on our second image here, we have maybe some 
several centimeter tense bullet with maybe some scattered vesicles over an erythematous base. So really I would say our primary lesion here are those bullet. And this makes me think about the vesicular bullus category, which is essentially conditions that involve vesicles and bullet. And that can include uh, our immunobullous disorders like pemphigus vulgaris, bullus pemphigoid, epidermal, and then some inherited or acquired conditions like epidermolysis bullosa, uh, dermatitis herpetiformis, bullus impetigo, and SJSTEN. In this next image, you can kind of see that involving the bilateral cheeks and the nose, you, there are many scattered inflammatory looking pustules and papules over an erythematous base. So that the distribution of these lesions and the appearance of many pa inflammatory papules and pustules resembles acne. So this would be in the acneiform family of conditions. So that can include acne vulgaris, ro rosacea, which is sometimes called adult acne, folliculitis and HS, although HS uh, typically has a different distribution. And then disorders of pigmentation, so you can have either hyper or hypopigmented uh, conditions. So here you see that involving kind of the chest and abdomen and right flank are uh, is a hypopigmented, what looks to be a patch right because i think it's more flat rather than a plaque which would be elevated although it's very sometimes difficult to tell from photos alone so a hypopigmented patch with irregular borders and possibly some fine scale although that is pretty hard to appreciate from this image so this hypopigmented condition is most consistent with tinea versicolor basically because I gave you the fine scale, but also the irregular borders. Uh, this could also be vitiligo, although vitiligo is often more depigmented rather than hypopigmented. It could be a tinea infection, albinism, piebaldism, ash leaf spots, as in tuberous sclerosis, and some uh, additional infections as well. Another important one I didn't mention is post-inflammatory hypopigmentation which is a normal phenomenon that is observed. So patients will exhibit or demonstrate some hypopigmented areas in areas with previous uh, inflammation. So for example, after you have a rash, you may see hypopigmentation in that same area for several months, and that's post-inflammatory hypopigmentation. So our first grouping, the papulosquamous grouping, uh, involves again those papules and plaques with an overlying scale. And our case vignette here is a 10 year old boy with these pyritic, erythematous, oozing, like kenified plaques over their flexor surfaces with crusting. They have, let's say they have a history, a personal history and family history of multiple allergies with rhinitis in the spring and they've had this rash uh, since they can remember, since very early childhood. So this is most consistent with atopic dermatitis. And in infants, the distribution actually isn't the same as in childhood and adulthood. In infants, the distribution of atopic dermatitis is actually the face and extensor surfaces. And I have seen this uh, tested in the past. And while, whereas in children and adults, atopic dermatitis more commonly involves the flexor surfaces, so maybe the antecubital fossa, popliteal fossa, maybe neck, um, rather than the face and extensor surfaces in infants. The pathophys of atopic dermatitis is complex, but is essentially epidermal barrier dysfunction, where the surface layer of skin has a compromised barrier, which makes skin more prone to infection, uh, immune dysregulation, and changing the environment, essentially the skin can't trap in as much moisture as normal. And this atopic dermatitis is associated with uh, mutations in filaggrin, which is an important protein in the epidermal barrier.
And because of these changes to the epidermal barrier, the treatment is also related. So treatment of atopic dermatitis involves topical emollients. That can include things like Vaseline, Aquaphor, or topical uh, creams. And that can help uh, maintain the skin barrier and, and really create kind of an additional layer for patients for the skin to trap moisture. Hypoallergenic cleansers, so really avoiding fragrance, which can be a trigger. Uh, other trigger avoidance and avoiding allergens and also topical corticosteroids. So really the medium strength topical steroids like uh, triamcinolone over the trunk and body and then maybe a weaker steroid like topical hydrocortisone over flexor areas like the antecubital fossa and the neck and the face as well. Now let's say we have a patient with papules and plaques with an overlying silvery scale on extensor surfaces and when we pick off a piece of the scale there is pinpoint bleeding also known as a positive auspice sign. So that's most consistent with psoriasis in this case this would be a variant known as plaque psoriasis. There's another form of psoriasis that is sometimes tested that can occur weeks after patients have a sore throat or a viral infection, but classically strep throat. Uh, and that can show up kind of like this image here on the lower left with these, these teardrop shaped lesions, often on the back or trunk. That's gut tape psoriasis, gut tape meaning teardrop. And again, that occurs several weeks after typically group A strep throat. Uh, what nail finding is seen in psoriasis? So the nail finding that can be seen in psoriasis is nail pitting and a nickel lysis, which is separation of the nail plate from the nail bed. A musculoskeletal complication that can arise with psoriasis is psoriatic arthritis, which is one of our uh, seronegative spondyloarthropathies. And again, you can remember those with the pair mnemonic, P-A-I-R, that's psoriatic arthritis, ankylosing spondylosis, uh, inflammatory bowel disease associated arthritis, and uh, reactive arthritis or Reiter's disease. That's the uh, can't see, can't pee, can't climb a tree. And patients with psoriatic arthritis should be referred to rheumatology because a lot of times when determining what treatment especially if these patients are going to receive a biologic story arthritis will factor into the equation to determine what will be used to manage the story arthritis. So these patients should receive a workup from rheumatology. And you can see here that patients with psoriatic arthritis will have that characteristic pencil and cup deformity seen on a uh, x-ray of the hand. The pathophysiology of psoriasis involves an auto, essentially autoimmune dysregulation and an excessive proliferation in keratinocytes that uh, causes kind of the adherent scale. Uh, psoriasis has also been associated with metabolic syndrome and can be associated with things like HIV and other uh, infections. Treatment of psoriasis involves, so for limited disease, topical vitamin D analogs like calcipotriene, topical steroids, so that can be either your medium strength triamcinolone or high potency, which is your clobetasol. You can also consider UV light, retinoids, and biologics for more systemic disease. So some of the biologics used in psoriasis include Humira, which is a TNF inhibitor, and Things like Skyrizi, which you may have seen commercials for, that's an IL-23 inhibitor, I believe. Importantly, in treatment of plaque psoriasis, you want to avoid systemic steroids like prednisone because upon withdrawal of systemic steroids, patients can actually develop postular psoriasis, which is another variant of psoriasis. And postular psoriasis uh, often involves kind of the palms and soles and may be more difficult to treat and you may have to treat that more aggressively. Here is another example of classic plaque psoriasis, and you can see the well-demarcated papules and plaques with overlying silvery adherent scale.
Now, say we have a patient that presents with pyritic, planar, polygonal, and purple papules and plaques. On exam of the oral mucosa, you also see these white reticular lesions on the inside of the cheek. These lesions are distributed mostly along the elbows and the wrists, and you can see some kebnerization, which uh, is what you see when uh, a skin lesion extends along areas of trauma. So here you may have uh, seen some scratching. So there may be extension of the process along this area of trauma. And then you also see these nails. Let's say this patient also has known chronic hepatitis C and also re recently started a thi thiazide diuretic. So this is most consistent with lichen planus. Uh, especially with the five P's and then the Wickham striae that you see, which are those uh, white reticular lesions. This common distribution involves the elbows and the flexor wrist. Lichen planus can affect the vulva, the oral mucosa, the nails, and the, uh, the nails, nail involvement in LP is actually associated with oral involvement and can be erosive oral involvement and also scalp or hair. Diagnosis of lichen planus involves a skin biopsy, especially if the vulva is involved. And on uh, uh, dermatopathology, you'll see uh, that so classic sawtooth appearance with inflammation of the dermal epidermal junction and hypergranulosis. Treatment of lichen planus involves a high potency topical steroid like clobetasol over the affected areas. There are other, many other treatments in clinical practice, including narrowband UVB light, and LP is often pretty hard to control. Now a 16-year-old boy with uh, viral symptoms a few weeks ago, followed by an annular pink patch that he describes, and then several days later, he describes a Christmas tree pattern of pink plaques with scaling. And on exam, you see this image on the bottom left and on the bottom right. And right here is the annular pink patch that he first noticed. So this is most consistent with pityriasis rosea. And you can, it's difficult to appreciate from these images, but you'll often note clinically that there's peripheral scaling in pityriasis rosea. And it'll be, the lesions will be in that Christmas tree distribution. Treatment of pityriasis rosea involves reassurance, antihistamines for symptom relief, topical corticosteroids, and this condition will also often resolve after several weeks to months. And again, pityriasis rosea is often associated with uh, preceding viral infections. Importantly, pityriasis rosea should spare the palms and soles. If the palms and soles are involved, you should consider syphilis because syphilis can present as a papillosquamous eruption that involves the palms and soles. Say we have a 50 year old gentleman that presents with a lesion that's grown over the last several months. And this lesion has a waxy stuck on appearance and a well demarcated border. You can see one here on the bottom left. So you can see that kind of stuck on appearance and it's well demarcated. So this is very common. This is a sebriate keratosis. Sometimes we call these wisdom spots. On biopsy, you'll see pseudohorn cysts and those keratin filled cysts. And treatment is uh, typically observation reassurance. These lesions are completely benign. They're not pre-malignant. There is one high yield boards association associated with the sudden appearance of many sebriate keratoses. This is called the lesser tray loss sign. And in these instances, you should suspect internal malignancies such as GI or lymphoid malignancies. In real life, it's much more common for patients that have many SKs to have just developed these SKs over the series of years. But if patients do truly have uh, an eruption of many sebriate keratoses, then this would be consistent with the lesser tray loss sign.
let's say we have a 40 year old gentleman with pruritic greasy scaling and erythematous plaques with scale or that involves the nasal labial folds the forehead the scalp eyebrows and there's notable dandruff on scalp examination you can see the images here with forehead involvement involvement of the nasal labial folds and then that dandruff so that's consistent with seborrheic dermatitis in infants seborrheic dermatitis is also called cradle cap and importantly treatment of seborrheic dermatitis differs in adults and infants treatment of seborrheic dermatitis in adults involves uh, primarily medicated shampoos with selenium and uh, ketoconazole shampoos and low potency steroids can also help uh, release symptoms especially for involvement on the face in infants, treatment of seborrheic dermatitis involves emollients, non-medicated shampoos, and then you can scrub them with a toothbrush sometimes with non-medicated shampoos, and then topical antifungals if needed. Now we have a 22-year-old wrestler with a pruritic enlarging erythematous annular plaque with central clearing and overlying scale. And you can see some images here of what that might look like. Yeah, and that is a tinea or infection, which is a dermatophyte. And some of the genus names that test examiners will sometimes go after. There are three main genus names for tinea infections or tinea species. And that's uh, Microsporum, Trichophyton, and Epidermophyton. So though, again, those are the genus names. And sometimes you'll see those as answer choices. On the head, tinea infection is called tinea capitis. On the body, it's called tinea corporis. On, in the inguinal region, it's called tinea cruris. And on the foot, it's called tinea pedis. The most common subtype of tinea pedis is the interdigital subtype, meaning between the, between the toes. So this would be the interdigital subtype here. On the nails, it's called a nicomycosis. And diagnosis of tinea infection involves a clinical diagnosis. You can often tell if something is tinea uh, by the morphology, right? Because it has that characteristic annular plaque with central clearing and overlying scale and kind of an erythematous border. But uh, KOH prep will also show branting septae and hyphae, or branting septate hyphae. Immunocompromised states can make this more extensive, so that can include HIV, diabetes, uh, and steroid use, like systemic steroids like prednisone. Treatment includes topical azoles like cotrimazole, gris topical griseofolvin, topical terbinafine, which is lamisil. And then more extensive disease may require um, systemic therapy with oral terbinafine. A nicomycosis often requires oral terbinafine, which is systemic treatment. Um, but for resolution on the bottom left we also have some unique subtypes of tinea infection this is a carrion which is a deeper inflammation of dermatophytes into hair follicles which is a more inflammatory subtype of tinea infection and on the right we have um, a myoki granuloma which is also tinea infection into hair follicles which extends deeper than a typical tinea infection that um, extends past just the epidermis. Some more basic science concepts in dermatology that I think are important for us to cover are the cell junctions that are commonly tested. So the main cell junctions that I'll cover here are the tight junctions, adherence junctions, desmosome, gap junction, the hemidesmosome, and then the, uh, the hemidesmosome which connects the um, the skin layer to the epidermis to the basement membrane. So tight junctions, these prevent the paracellular movement of solute. And um, these are composed of occludins and claudins. Those are the proteins that compose this junction. Adherence junctions, I remember these because there's a protein called e cadherin which is a calcium mediated uh, protein in the adherence junction, thus the name cadherins. 
And these form kind of a belt and act as a junction um, connecting the actin cytoskeleton between uh, adjacent cells. Importantly, the loss of e-cadherin is one of the routes in which uh, tumor cells can actually metastasize because when tumor cells lose e-cadherin, uh, they're more able to uh, kind of leave the cellular matrix and uh, enter different, uh, different parts of the body and thereby metastasize. The desmosomes are uh, the, these provide structural support via the intermediate filaments and importantly for dermatology autoantibodies to desmosome proteins desmoglein 1 and desmoglein 3 are implicated in pemphigus vulgaris. Gap junctions, as you know, um, have connexons, which are the proteins that permit electrical and chemical communication between the adjacent cells. The hemidesmosome contains proteins that connect the keratin in the basal layer of the epidermis to the underlying basement membrane. Autoantibodies to proteins in the hemidesmosome uh, are seen in bullous pemphigoid. So to apply this, we'll cover some of the immunobullous disorders. So let's say we have a 45-year-old gentleman with painful flaccid bullae that rupture easily. There's a positive Nikolsky and oral involvement. So this is pemphigus vulgaris and you note the oral involvement and the flaccid bullae. Uh, diagnosis involves serum testing for IgG antidesmoglein antibodies and then biopsy uh, at the margin for both DIF which is direct immunofluorescence and uh, H&E staining. Biopsy with the same will show that net-like reticular pattern here with keratinolysis. Treatment involves systemic corticosteroids, and these patients often require maintenance immunosuppression with an immunomodulating agent like mycophenolate and rituximab. Often, wet wraps will also be used uh, with topical steroids. But here you can see those ruptured flaccid bullae that are characteristic of pemphigus vulgaris, right, because it's antibodies against desmoglein, uh, which are desmosomes, so that's an intraepidermal split. And then pemphigus vulgaris is more commonly associated with oral involvement. Our other commonly tested aminobullous disorder, let's say we have a 40 or a 60 year old, so a little bit older woman with tense bullae. So here you can see a tense bullae that doesn't easily rupture at flexural regions in the abdomen. Initially, these bullae were mildly pruritic, and she has no oral involvement. Nikolsky side is negative. So this is bullous pemphigoid, and the pathophysiology involves detachment of the basal layer of, of the epidermis from the basement membrane, right, because you get those antibodies against the hemidesmosome. Diagnosis of bullous pemphigoid involves, again, serum testing now for antibodies against uh, hemidesmosomes, and then with biopsy, you'll want to take uh, usually the, the active edge for direct immunofluorescence and H&E &E staining. And you'll see uh, on, H, on uh, immunofluorescence, you'll see linear immunofluorescence at the DEJ. And contrast that with bullous pemphigoid, which is that reticular pattern, whereas bullous pemphigoid is a linear pattern. Treatment involves, uh, first line, it's a high potency topical steroid, especially limited disease, but also systemic agents like oral doxycycline and systemic steroids can be used. Now we have a 21 year old woman that's presenting with these pruritic grouped vesicles. Here they're ruptured or maybe scratched off and bullae over the elbows Let's say she's also had some loose stools over the last several months and a five pound weight loss. She also notes that she's had some vision changes at night. On exam, you see these excoriated erosions over the elbows, on both elbows. So this is dermatitis herpetiformis, or DH, and the pathophys involves IgA deposition at the tips of the dermal papillae and it's associated with celiac disease, and that's a very, very high yield association. 
for dermatitis or pediformis. And this celiac disease explains a lot of her other systemic symptoms, including the weight loss, diarrhea, steatorrhea, and her fat-soluble vitamin deficiency. Though fat-soluble vitamins are A, D, E, and K, right? And vitamin A is very important for retina, uh, retinal function, and without, retin without vitamin A, you can have uh, night blindness. Diagnosis involves uh, serum testing for anti-gliadin, anti-tissue transglutaminase, anti-endomesial IgA antibodies, and anti-IgG antibodies can be obtained if patients are IgA deficient. Skin biopsy demonstrates collection of neutrophils within dermal papillae uh, that coalesce. Uh, on endoscopy, so patients will receive upper endoscopy and also lower endoscopy. And uh, on endoscopy, you will see duodenal villus atrophy or flattening. And that's shown here. So here you can see the villus flattening, which causes uh, malabsorption, especially in duodenum. Treatment of dermatitis herpetiformis in particular uh, involves Dapsone. That's a very, very effective medication for DH and also gluten avoidance for uh, prevention of recurrence. And that's very similar to the treatment of celiac disease. Now, a 30-year-old gentleman with past medical history of chronic hepatitis C that recently drank alcohol, maybe was sitting out in the sun, that has a painful blistering rashes on the hands and sun-exposed skin. You also note some scattered hyperpigmented macules on the bilateral dorsal hands. This is Porphyria cutanea tarda, and he also has post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation because a lot of the blisters and PCT can become hyperpigmented and actually scar. The pathophase of PCT involves a deficient uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase enzyme, and you get a buildup of a metabolite in the uh, porphyrin pathway. Hep C is also associated with LP, like in planets that we talked about earlier, and mixed cryoglobinemia. Labs that you want to obtain in PCT include uh, liver enzymes, so probably a complete metabolic panel, hepatitis C, iron overload panel, so an iron panel, and then you want to obtain urine and plasma porphyrin. On Woods Lamp, you can see coral red urine, which is shown here. And treatment of PCT involves serial phlebotomy, chloroquine, strict photoprotection, and avoidance of triggers. So these triggers can involve uh, barbiturates, alcohol, and other uh, cytochrome P450 inducers. And that's because uh, cytochrome in upregulation of cytochrome P450 increases a metabolite that's a precursor to this one here, uh, uroporphyrinogen 3. So upregulating cytochrome P450 will lead to an increased buildup of this intermediate. And this is the intermediate that mediates the symptoms of PCT. You want to contrast PCT with AIP, acute intermittent porphyria. And acute intermittent porphyria has those five Ps, right? Like the painful abdomen, polyneuropathy, etc. Here we have a 21-year-old woman with recurrent bulle and ulcers uh, with mild trauma since childhood. And this is most consistent with epidermolysis bullosa. And importantly, epidermolysis bullosa is, uh, has several subtypes. So there's both an autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive subtype, and there's also generalized, localized, and dystrophic subtypes of epidermolysis bullosa. So understanding the different subtypes is often beyond the scope of the test, but you should know that epidermolysis bullosa uh, can be inherited. So patients will present with uh, these bullae after minor trauma uh, since a very, very young age. And the pathophys involves inherited mutations in keratin proteins, so the epithelium is more, uh, more fragile. Diagnosis involves, can involve skin, skin biopsy and also genetic screening. Treatment involves avoidance of trauma and then wound care and pain management. 
now some targetoid lesions. So these targetoid lesions here um, uh, are commonly tested from what I've seen. So let's say we have an 18-year-old male with some target-shaped lesions. And these have a violaceous center and a surrounding ring of pallor and an erythematous border. So this is most consistent with erythema multiforme. And there's a very high yield association with EM, and that's HSV1 and mycoplasma pneumoniae. There are also a few drugs that are associated with EM, including sulfa drugs and phenytoin. Treatment of EM involves uh, supportive care and reassurance. Typically, this uh, resolves spontaneously. Now, moving on to some dermatologic emergencies. Let's say we have a 45 year old that initially had a fever, malaise, myalgia, sore throat, maybe last week or a few weeks ago. Also had some bullae and some targetoid lesions over the face and trunk at that time. Now presents with very extensive bullae and sloughing of skin, including the mucous membranes with positive Nikolsky sign. This patient recently started Bactrim a few weeks ago for a UTI. So this is Stevens Johnson syndrome, and this patient experienced the classic prodromal phase with a fever, malaise, sore throat, and myalgia, and, and has mucocutaneous involvement. So when evaluating SJS, you should almost always have mucocutaneous involvement. So that's kind of the oral mucosa, lips, uh, eyes, uh, can involve the vulva in SJS and TEN, and it's typically an adverse drug reaction. So Bactrim, TMP sulfa is a very classic example of uh, offending medication in SJS, TEN. So other medications include allopurinol, so other antibiotics, phenytoin, so our anti-epileptics, lamotrigine, carbamazepine, NSAIDs, and sulfalazine. Importantly with lamotrigine, this is a commonly tested topic that any patient that develops a rash with lamotrigine should be evaluated and should have the medication stopped because lamotrigine, 10 although 10% of patients with lamotrigine can cause a rash, uh, lamotrigine is known to cause SJS. If SJS is greater than 30% involvement, that's called TEN, toxic epidermal necrolysis. And if the involvement is between 10 and 30%, that's an overlap syndrome. Treatment of SJS involves stopping the offending agent. So typically we will stop all drugs except for those necessary for survival of the patient. IV steroids, so IV prednisone, burn consult. So a lot of times these patients are admitted to the burn unit for wound care because they need fairly extensive wound care. Intense IV fluids, as with burns, these patients can lose a lot of fluid. And there is a high mortality rate with SJS. Another basic science slide. In this basic science slide, I'll cover the pathway for pigmentation, so production of melanin. So we start with amino acid phenylalanine, which is converted with cofactor BH4 and the enzyme phenylalanine hydroxylase to tyrosine. Tyrosine is converted to DOPA, and DOPA is then converted with tyrosinase to melanin, which is ultimately responsible for pigment in our body. Uh, notably, patients with PKU can have deficiency in phenylalanine hydroxylase or can have a deficiency in production of BH4. So patients with PKU can actually have lighter skin tones as well due to reduced production of tyrosine and thereby reduced production of melanin. Patients with albinism can have a deficiency in tyrosinase, uh, which can lead to reduced production of melanin and thereby hypopigmentation. And an important pathway to know for, in, for a neurology is that DOPA results in, from the same pathway, and this intermediate is used to produce dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine, and Parkinson's is mediated by uh, uh, decreased dopamine and decreased DOPA in, uh, in the body. So more basics of pigmentation are that melanocytes are present in the basalis layer of the epidermis. Uh, 
and they function to produce melanin and they also create melanosomes and transfer the melanin via microtubules to uh, keratinocytes via dendrites. Importantly, melanocyte size and distribution is what explains differences between light and dark skin, not the number of melanocytes. At the bottom figure, we can see the Fitzpatrick classification, and you can see that uh, lighter skin tones are closer to Fitzpatrick 1, and darker skin tones are will be a higher Fitzpatrick number, either five, uh, usually up to 5 um, and 6 in this image. And lighter skin tones, as we know, are typically more UV sensitive. So a few disorders of pigmentation. So patients with a congenital lack of pigmentation uh, have albinism, and that can be either deficiency in tyrosinase or non-functioning tyrosinase or defective tyrosinase uh, production or transport, which matches with the, uh, the pathway that we discussed just now. Again, PKU can be associated with lighter skin tones because there's a deficiency in uh, production of tyrosinase from phenylalanine. There's also a high yield immunodeficiency associated with albinism. Uh, this can also be associated with deficient mic uh, neutrophil migration. So if you have def deficient neutrophil migration and albinism, this is Chede Higashi syndrome, and that's a microtubule defect. Uh, and again, the melanocyte count in albinism will be normal, but there will be decreased melanin production because of a non-functioning tyrosinase or effective tyrosinase or tyrosine transport. And here you can see a patient with albinism, and you can note the lack of pigmentation on the hair and the skin. Now on the right, we have a patient with a white forelock on the scalp. That's pigmentism, and this is due to disordered melanocyte migration, which is part of the neural crest. So melanocytes uh, migration is, is part of neural crest migration. Next, some um, disorders of hypopigmentation. So let's say we have a 25-year-old woman with non-pyritic, progressive, painless loss of pigment of the skin. This is vitiligo. And the pathophysiology of vitiligo is localized depigmentation due to autoimmune destruction of melanocytes. And vitiligo is an autoimmune condition that is associated with autoimmune destruction of melanocytes. And like other autoimmune conditions, vitiligo is associated with autoimmune conditions like uh, Hashimoto's and Addison's. So we often screen patients and ask these review of system questions uh, if they have vitiligo. On biopsy, you'll see loss of uh, melanocytes in the skin due to autoimmune destruction. And treatment of vitiligo depends on patient preference, but uh, treatment can involve topical steroids. And if vitiligo is extensive, then oral steroids, topical calcineurin inhibitors like tacrolimus, topical JAK inhibitors, and then UV light as well. Importantly, in disorders of hypopigmentation, you can use a Woods lamp to distinguish vitiligo from other uh, causes of hypopigmentation. Because in vitiligo, you should see true depigmentation because the melanocytes have been destroyed. So you would see much more bright fluorescence uh, under a Woods lamp compared to something like this image on the right, which would have uh, pronounced depigmentation, but or hypopigmentation, but not the pronounced depigmentation you'd see with vitiligo. So for this image on the right, let's say we have a 26-year-old man returning from spring break in Cancun, and he has these mildly pruritic scattered hypopigmented uh, patches or very thin plaque with an overlying fine scale, and you see these irregular borders. This is consistent with tinea versicolor, or also known as pityriasis versicolor. And the cause of tinea versicolor is an overgrowth of malassezia yeast. Um, and this is more common in hot and humid weather. Uh, this can stimulate the overgrowth of the malassezia yeast. And the hypopigmentation, notably, becomes more pronounced after sun exposure because the surrounding skin becomes darker 
than the area affected. Diagnosis uh, in involves wood la woods lamp and then also KOH prep, which will show the characteristic spaghetti and meatballs hyphae and yeast. Treatment for tinea versicolor involves topical azoles like ketoconazole, uh, can involve topical terbinafine and also selenium shampoo to prevent remission or prevent uh, recurrence. Now this next case it isn't necessarily primarily classified as a hypopigmented uh, disorder, uh, but uh, these lesions can be associated with hypopigmentation. I didn't really have anywhere else to fit it in. So uh, uh, let's say we have a 40 year old zookeeper with an erythematous hypopigmented elevated plaque and reduced sensation in that area. Yeah, so this is Mycobacterium leprae. And here you can kind of see that elevated plaque that I'm talking about. Uh, there isn't as much epidermal change, so not as much scaling or things like that. It's more of a dermal change which kind of leads you to believe uh, leads you to think about dermal infiltration the most common reservoir for mycobacteria leprae in the united states is armadillos and on the left here this form of leprosy is a tuberculoid form of leprosy where it's that localized cutaneous reaction and on the right you can see the lepromatous which is more of a th2 reaction uh, form of leprosy which and on the right, you see the leonine facies. Uh, that's a result of the infiltrated skin from uh, mycobacteria leprae. Diagnosis involves biopsy, and you want to take a biopsy of the active border. Treatment involves dapsone and rifampin for six months. Now we have an eight-year-old uh, boy with unknown family history presenting with seizures, angiofibromas over the face, leathery skin lesions, so those leathery plaques, and a hypopigmented patch here. This is consistent with tuberous sclerosis, and that hypopigmented patch is an ash leaf spot. Uh, this spot here is a shagreen patch, uh, but it's actually a plaque, but it's named a shagreen patch, but it is elevated and raised, and then angiofibromas over the face. Tuberous sclerosis is associated with the development of many hamartomas, which are essentially benign proliferations of normal uh, skin of normal tissue in the area. So you can also, along with these cutaneous findings, you can see angiomyolipomas and cardiac rhabdomyomas. There's a mutation in the TSC1 or TSC2 genes, uh, which code for the hamartin and tuberin proteins, respectively. And here you see uh, some uh, unguoma, which is another uh, uh, benign proliferation of the nail seen in tuberous sclerosis. All right, so instead of conditions uh, associated with hypopigmentation, we'll move on to hyperpigmentation. So starting off, we have a 28-year-old woman, G2P1, presenting with darkening of her cheeks. And you can see in the bottom left, kind of some hyperpigmented areas in the bilateral cheeks. This is most consistent with melasma, also known as the mask of pregnancy. Development of melasma can also be associated with uh, oral contraceptive pills. Treatment of melasma uh, involves strict photoprotection because that can worsen the hyperpigmentation and also uh, cosmetic skin bleaching agents if patients desire such as uh, topical hydroquinones and this would you would initiate these after delivery on the right here we have a three-day-old infant presenting with uh, flat bluish gray patches over the buttocks and lower back this is very common and this is congenital dermal melanocytosis in the past this was called mongolian spot if you see these it's important to document them because it helps the pediatrician know in the future that uh, these aren't bruises and that they're uh, they were present uh, since a very early age since these spots can also take also often take many years to resolve and 
they can look a lot like bruises. Now we have a 50 year old woman that's presenting with hyperpigmentation of the skin and gums. And on review, you also note that she has had several months of fatigue, abdominal pain, hypotension to 90 over 50, hyperkalemia and non-ion non, um, anion gap metabolic acidosis. So this is most consistent with primary adrenal insufficiency or uh, at, which can be caused by Addison's disease, which is an autoimmune form. The pathophysiology of the hyperpigmentation is an increased uh, MSH, melanocyte stimulating hormone, secondary to increased ACTH production, right? Because your body wants to produce more ACTH so that you produce more uh, cortisol uh, from the adrenal glands, but because you have adrenal insufficiency, you'll have increased ACTH and the ACTH will stimulate production of MSH, which will lead to hyperpigmentation. And it's a, that's, the hyperpigmentation can be important because that can help you distinguish from primary adrenal insufficiency and secondary adrenal insufficiency. Where, because in secondary adrenal insufficiency, which is uh, de decreased ACTH, you'll have uh, no, you won't have in, uh, increased MSH. So you won't see hyperpigmentation in secondary adrenal insufficiency. Next, we have a 50-year-old gentleman uh, with jaundice, recently diagnosed diabetes, dilated cardiomyopathy, joint pain, history of vibrio vulnificus infection, and hypothyroidism, who's presenting with a bronze to brownish hyperpigmentation of his skin. This is consistent with hemochromatosis, which is also called bronze diabetes. And uh, as we know, hemochromatosis, which is due to iron overload, is associated with diabetes, Cardiomyopathy, the most common form of which it is dilated cardiomyopathy and hemochromatosis. Joint pain, uh, specifically pseudogout um, with CPPD crystals. Uh, Vibrio vulnificus is a bug that will um, typically inf uh, infect patients with liver issues. So that can include um, patients with alcoholic cirrhosis or cirrhosis from hemochromatosis and patients with hemochromatosis often get hypothyroidism as well due to iron buildup. The pathophys of, of the hyperpigmentation of hemochromatosis is uh, hemosiderin deposition within the dermal macrophages and some tests you should obtain in patients with hemochromatosis are genetic testing um, to look for mutation in the HFE gene iron studies, and uh, usually a complete metabolic panel with LFTs. Treatment of hemochromatosis is a serial phlebotomy. And on this image, you can see a Prussian blue stain of a liver biopsy. Uh, iron shows up as uh, blue on liver biopsy. So you can see here there's iron overload on the Prussian blue stain. Now we're, we're on our next subgrouping of derm conditions at the acneiform lesions. So starting off simple, we'll have a 16 year old boy with comedones, pustules, inflamed papules over the forehead and cheeks. Let's say he's had a recent growth spurt. So this is acne vulgaris, vulgaris meaning the most common. And the pathophys involves chronic inflammation of the hair follicles and the sebaceous units and the keratinization of the epidermis blocks the sebum so acne commonly affects areas with many pilosebaceous units so that can be the face uh, chest and back there is one bug that is associated with formation of acne vulgaris and that's propionobacterium acnes or cutibacterium acnes and these colonize the sebaceous glands and release inflammatory fatty acids Puberty can exacerbate acne because of uh, the production of androgens, especially uh, DHT, dihydrotestosterone, which increases serum production. Treatment of acne involves, uh, depends on the severity of acne. So severity of acne differs between comedonal, inflammatory, and the nodular cystic acne being the most severe. For more mild forms of acne, like comedonal acne, uh, or um, you can use uh, topical retinoids like Retin-A, which is uh, tretinoin, salicylic acid, which is uh, keratolytic, 
uh, vitamin or vitamin A analogs or retinoids are really our treatment of choice in acne because these reduce keratinization and sebum production. For inflammatory acne, you can continue using topical retinoids and add in benzoyl peroxide, which is an antimicrobial. And then you could add in topical or oral antibiotics like doxycycline if the inflammatory acne is more severe. For nodular cystic acne, the most severe subtype of acne, you can consider oral or systemic vitamin A, which is in the form of isotretinoin, which is Accutane. And here you can see the scale of severity ranging from your comedonal acne to your inflammatory acne, and then your nodular cystic acne, and you can see some scarring as well from uh, the nodular acne. Before starting oral isotretinoin or isotretinoin, you want to obtain two negative pregnancy tests a month apart and then a monthly pregnancy test while on uh, isotretinoin. So as we discussed, acne is characterized in terms of severity and going from mild to more severe subtypes of acne, we start with comedonal acne and here you can see the open comedones which result from oxidation and melanin deposition and then closed comedones, which are also called whiteheads. Papulopustular acne is characterized by larger, larger inflammatory papules and pustules. These are often tender and painful, and this is a moderate severity of acne. And nodulocystic acne, the most severe subtype of acne, is characterized by large inflammatory papules, pustules, and large cysts. These are often tender and painful and often cause scarring. This is the most severe type of acne. Our approach to therapies also, depend on the, the, also depends on the severity of the acne. So for comedonal acne, uh, papulopustular acne, and nodulocystic acne, we recommend non-comedogenic moisturizers and sunscreen. Uh, st with the more mild subtypes of acne, we start with topical retinoids and salicylic acid, and then we add BPO or benzoyl peroxide after that. Then we can add topical antibiotics like topical clindamycin and escalate to systemic antibiotics if patients still are experiencing a lot of acne. In women, especially with hormonal acne, so acne that worsens with their menstrual cycles or um, really involves the jawline, then we can use spironolactone or OCPs, which can reduce the androgenic effects and improve acne. And then the kind of nuclear option, the strongest option we have for acne is uh, isotretinoin, so systemic or oral isotretinoin, also called Accutane. Here we have a 25-year-old woman with erythematous papules and pustules that worsen after drinking alcohol and she has flushing. She also has occasional pimples and she was previously treated with uh, for acne, which has since resolved. This is most consistent with rosacea, acne rosacea. Acne rosacea can involve the nose, which is called rhinophyma. And this is a bulbous deformity of the nose. You can see that on the right here. You can also have ocular rosacea and also have lip margin telangiectasias and conjunctival hyperemia uh, with rosacea. Triggers for rosacea include alcohol and heat, and your differential diagnosis, um, rosacea shouldn't have comedones, so acne will have comedones, whereas rosacea mostly has these inflammatory papules. Treatment of rosacea um, depends on patient preference, so if there is significant papules, inflammatory papules, then topical metronidazole and doxycycline can help reduce the inflammation. Uh, for the er erythrotelangiectatic subtype or erythromatotelangiectatic subtype, laser and topical bromodidine can help, although uh, treatment isn't necessary in these patients. A lot of times they can hide it uh, with makeup or lotions or things like that. This section will cover skin cancer. This is a very high yield topic and is something I see very commonly confused. 
So starting off, let's say we have a 75-year-old gentleman presenting with rough, gritty, scaly plaques with hyperkeratosis over the face and the, scal and the scalp and the dorsal hands. He was a farmer for his occupation, is now retired. This is most consistent with actinic keratosis, especially the, those buzzwords of the rough, gritty spots. This is a precursor to squamous cell carcinoma. And uh, on the boards, you should biopsy actinic keratosis. Clinically, it's, we very rarely biopsy actinic keratosis unless we're concerned it's uh, progressed to a squamous cell carcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma in situ. But on the exams, uh, you'll typically want to biopsy this lesion to be sure it's not squamous cell because it can re it really can resemble squamous cell just from the images and it's hard to tell without uh, feeling it. So treatment of squamous cell carcinoma is cryotherapy and then 5-FU, 5-fluorouracil, uh, which is a chemotherapy cream if they have extensive involvement. So in this patient, they may benefit from 5-fluorouracil and also in mode. I would say a general tip for the boards are that the boards tend to like the cheapest therapies and also the most conservative therapies. So in this case, the most conservative approach would be to biopsy because that can tell you for sure whether or not a, a lesion is benign or malignant. Well, not benign or pre-malignant or has transformed to become an invasive squamous cell. On the right, we have another subtype of a squamous tumor. So let's say a 60 year old gentleman has a cup shaped tumor filled with keratin debris. This has grown rapidly over the last several weeks. So this is a keratoacanthoma, acanthoma, which is a very well differentiated squamous cell carcinoma. Treatment involves excision. On the board exams, uh, sometimes you will see that these lesions can resolve spontaneously, but in clinic, uh, we treat these as an invasive squamous cell carcinoma, so we either excise these, so we would cut it out like this and stitch it back up, or we could do a shave, removal, and then curette the base and kind of the edges to make sure the lesion's gone. So more skin cancer vignettes. So let's say we have an ulcerative red lesion with scaling and Emphasis on the scaling because that tells you there's epidermal change. That's squamous cell carcinoma. That's a second most common form of skin cancer. On biopsy, you'll see keratin pearls. And then you'll also see cellular pleomorphism, hyperchromatism, and nuclear atypia. There's increased risk of squamous cell carcinoma with immunosuppression. So any immunosuppression, like in transplant patients or patients in chronic steroid uh, on chronic steroids will have increased risk for skin cancers and that can include basal cells squamous cells melanoma also there's a special subtype of squamous cell carcinoma known as a marginal ulcer that can arise in chronic scars chronic wounds and chronic burn sites invasive squamous cell carcinoma treatment is with an excision so you'll want to take a margin of four to six millimeters uh, around the periphery of the, of the squamous cell and then excise from there. For a squamous cell in situ, you can do an excision, you can do a curatage and electrofulguration. You can do cryotherapy in some cases, although that's very rarely used. Five floor year cell or micro mode. Really your go-to will be the surgical excision is kind of the definitive treatment. And then SEC in situ, which you can see here, is also known as Bowen's disease. Now, the most common type of skin cancer, you may see a vignette like this. So a waxy pink lesion with pearl-like papules or nodules, rolled borders, and may have some central ulceration, like in this image with telangiectasia. And on dermoscopy, you may see, or basically a magnifying glass, you may see disordered telangiectasia or disordered blood vessels. So this is basal cell carcinoma or basal cell cancer. This is the most common skin cancer that we see. I think it's the most common cancer overall 
actually, and up to one fifth of um, uh, one fifth of people in the United States will get some type of skin cancer by age 70. Biopsy of basal cell carcinoma reveals uh, basophilic staining, especially with that peripheral palisading. That's really a uh, key histologic feature of basal cell carcinoma. Treatment of basal cell carcinoma, invo again, involves surgical excision with high four millimeter margins. And then something I didn't cover with squamous cell carcinoma is that in areas of uh, high risk areas, or high risk subtypes of basal cell carcinoma. Uh, Mohs surgery is indicated, and basically in Mohs surgery, they'll go layer by layer. So they'll t take the skin, so they'll take a first layer, and then if they see a positive margin, then they may go ahead and take more. So this would be a second layer, and they go until the layer is, is clear. So that is, Mohs surgery is used to preserve tissue in areas where there isn't as much skin so that can be like the face or sometimes like the shins where an excision may be not the best best option and may also be used in cases when you really want to make sure the tumor is fully excised because Mohs has the highest cure rate of any procedure in removing uh, cutaneous tumors also basal cells rare, very very rarely metastasize usually they're just locally invasive so here we have, uh, this is a classic type of basal cell. Here's a superficial basal cell on the right. And then on the bottom image, you see a scar-like presentation of basal cell, also called a morpheiform presentation. This is a high-risk form of basal cell. And since it's on a face and it's a high-risk basal cell, this patient should definitely get Mohs, uh, as we just talked about. Now some pigmented or melanocytic skin lesions so let's say we have a 40 year old woman with symmetric regular borders homogeneously colored lesions they've had it since childhood these have not increased in size so this is a nevus and the cause of nevus is a benign proliferation of melanocytes nevi can be associated with hair if they're congenital nevi and these progress from junctional from junctional nevi into intradermal nevi. So intradermal nevi or dermal nevi will be more elevated typically. And then in between your junctional nevi, which are more, which are in the epidermis, you can have uh, compound nevi, which are both in the epidermis and the dermis, and then intradermal nevi, which are in the dermis and are more raised. The ABCDEs of melanoma are very, very high yield. That's asymmetry, border irregularity, color variation, diameter greater than six millimeters, and evolution, which are changes in the shape of the lesion. The most important prognostic factor in melanoma is the Breslau thickness, which is essentially the depth of invasion. And the different subtypes of melanoma include acral lentiginous melanoma, nodular melanoma, superficial spreading melanoma, which is the most common subtype and has the best prognosis, and then let to go maligna. Diagnosis of melanoma requires excisional biopsies for exams. Excisional biopsy of any suspicious pigmented lesion will essentially always be the correct answer on uh, these standardized examinations because we want to evaluate the depth of invasion because that, again, has a prognostic, fa prognostic factor, and any invasion past a certain depth will actually determine what the best next step is. Uh, for most cases um, with uh, low breast low depth, uh, you can do an exc ex excision, a wide local excision, but if the breast low depth is deep enough, then you'll need to do um, wide, lo a wide local excision with lymph node extraction and possible uh, adjuvant chemoradiation depending on the sentinel lymph node biopsy. Hypersensitivity reactions are also another very commonly tested topic in Durham and other topics as well, and other fields as well. So I'm just gonna quickly go over the hypersensitivity types. 
So type 1 hypersensitivity is mediated by IgE. You can see this in anaphylaxis and atopy. There's an early and late phase, and you can see uh, this in urticaria and anaphylaxis. Here you can see hives or uh, cutaneous wheels. Type 2 is uh, mediated by antibodies against cellular antigens. So that can cause cellular destruction, cellular dysfunction, and inflammation. This may, sh um, this may be seen in pemphigus vulgaris and bullus pemphigoid, where there are antibodies against um, skin components or epidermal components, right, in the epidermal dermal junction. Type 3, hypersensitivity is associated with immune complex with an antigen, so that can be seen in serum sickness, serum sickness-like reactions. And type 4, which we'll focus on, is mediated by uh, T cells, so both CD4 and uh, CD8 cytotoxic T cells. This is more of a delayed reaction and can be seen in allergic contact dermatitis and other drug reactions. So type 4 hypersensitivity, here's an example. So let's say we have a 45-year-old gentleman with a pyritic erythematous lichenified plaque with vesicles over the wrist a few weeks after getting a new watch. So this is most consistent with allergic contact dermatitis. And the most commonly associated metal is nickel. And the most commonly associated antibiotic with allergic contact dermatitis is neomycin. Following outdoor activity, you can see linear streaks, such as in this picture on the bottom right. And this is also an example of allergic contact dermatitis to poison ivy. The pathophys of allergic dermatitis involves exposure to an al allergen and sensitization and then re-exposure. So usually you will see uh, contact dermatitis several days to weeks after initial exposure to an antigen. On a biopsy, you can see epidermal spongiosis, lymphocyte infiltration, and this can involve both the epidermis and the deeper dermis. And again, it's mediated by T cells. To diagnose it, it's both a clinical diagnosis and there's something called patch testing, which is kind of the best clinical tool to determine what specific allergen somebody is allergic to. Treatment of allergic contact dermatitis involves removing the offending agent and high potency topical steroids like clobetasol. Here are a few vascular lesions that are fairly high yield as well. So we have a 50 year old gentleman that recently had a kidney transplant and then now presents with flat purple slightly elevated plaques with irregular borders that have progressed to violaceous papules over the face and back. So this is Kaposi sarcoma and some additional testing or lab testing you should obtain in patients that uh, present with spontaneous Kaposi sarcoma is uh, endoscopy because Kaposi sarcoma can often affect the, um, the GI tract and also lung imaging and then checking for causes for immunosuppression, such as HIV. Kaposi sarcoma is biopsied to rule out basilar angiomatosis from Bartonella Hensley infection. And you'll see uh, lymphocytic infiltration of Kaposi sarcoma with vascular proliferation compared to neutrophils in Bartonella Hensley infection. There's a viral infection association with Kaposi sarcoma, HHV8, and treatment involves treating the underlying immunosuppression. If HIV is the underlying cause, then that's often uh, antiretroviral therapy. Radiotherapy can be used, laser therapy, also excision. And uh, you can also use chemo to treat Kaposi sarcoma. In immunosuppressed patients, you should reduce immunosuppression and an organ transplant. You can switch uh, from tacrolimus to serolimus as the immunosuppressant because serolimus is an mTOR inhibitor. And that can actually help the Kaposi sarcoma. Next, we have a 14 year old boy that presents with a growing, occasionally tender lesion that bleeds vigorously over his finger. That's a pyogenic granuloma. You can also see these during see pyogenic granulomas during pregnancy. A few perineoplastic derm conditions. So here we have a 65-year-old woman with difficulty combing her hair, muscle weakness, a violaceous heliotrope rash, and erythema around the eyes. 
an erythema in a shawl and face distribution with Gotron papules of her knuckles. So this is dermatomyositis, which is associated with adenocarcinoma and also associated with lung fibrosis. Um, dermatomyositis um, is commonly associated, I believe, with uh, ovarian carcinoma and also GI malignancies. On muscle biopsy, you'll see paramecial inflammation with uh, CD4 positive cells. And the way I remember that is that dermatomyositis has skin findings, so it, it affects the outer layer of the muscle sheath, which, which is the paramecium. And here in these images, you can see the heliotrope rash and then the gotron papules. Here we have a 60-year-old female with muscle weakness without rash, and you can see the biopsy in this muscle biopsy in this image. This is polymyositis, which is associated again with carcinoma as a perineoplastic. On muscle biopsy, you'll see endomesial inflammation with CD8 cells, and contrast that again with dermatomyositis, which has CD4 cells and is in the perimesium compared to endomesium and polymyositis. Going over a few room derm cases, here we have a 30-year-old woman with chest pain that improves with leaning forward, pain in multiple joints, recurrent painless oral ulcers, and lab testing is significant for anemia, thrombocytopenia, and creatinine to 1.4. What are some common derm findings with this condition? So this is systemic lupus, and there's a good acronym for the um, diagnostic criteria from for systemic lupus, but systemic lupus can actually be diagnosed on clinical findings alone. In this case, we do have several lab findings suggesting um, systemic lupus. And some common derm findings are malar rash, seen here, and also discoid rash. Some antibodies that are associated with systemic lupus are anti-DSDNA, anti-SMITH, anti-phospholipid, and anti-cardiolipin. And mixed connective tissue disease is another rheumatologic condition. And this is basically a mix of systemic lupus, systemic sclerosis, and polymyositis. And on the bottom left here is where we can see our discoid lupus. I believe this is more subacute lupus with that very annular presentation. Uh, mixed connective tissue disease associated with anti-U1 RNP. Moving on to our next case, let's say we have a patient with Raynaud's capillary dropout, digital ulceration, thick and smooth skin that causes difficulty with PIP flexion and calcinosis cutis. <sighs> So this is systemic sclerosis, and this is also associated with widespread skin involvement and organ involvement, especially kidney involvement. One high yield fact is that in um, systemic sclerosis renal crisis, you want to use Captopril, which is an ACE inhibitor. In patients with systemic sclerosis, you also want to watch for pulmonary hypertension. Some antibodies associated with systemic sclerosis are uh, anti-SCL760, which is an anti-DNA topoisomerase antibody, and also anti-RNA polymerase 3. In limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis, the cutaneous findings are usually limited to those uh, uh, the skin that's distal to the elbow. And then Crest syndrome is a constellation of symptoms with calcinosis cutis, Raynaud's, esophageal dysmotility, sclerodactyly, and telangiectasia, but this is a more limited form of systemic sclerosis. The antibody associated with Crest is anti-centromere. And treatment for systemic sclerosis and serial monitoring involves serial uh, trans thoracic echo, pulmonary function testing, high-res chest CT, manometry, routine blood pressure testing, and ANA. And here you see some images of sclerodactyly, Raynaud's, and then calcinosis cutis. On this slide, we have uh, some rapid review of common skin infections that are tested.
and these will focus on viruses. So the first, first case we have here, we have these, the image on the right here, and you can see that you have the dewdrops on a rose appearance. You see those clustered vesicles over an erythematous base. You maybe have erythe erythema multiforme several weeks following this infection, and the initial presentation of, or the initial form of infection by this virus results in gingival stomatitis, and you may see cold sores. This is HSV. An important fact about HSV as well is that it can lie dormant in the trigeminal nerve, which is why it can become reactivated with triggers. And then the mechanism in which it re manifests itself is mediated through anterior transport with kinine fibers, or kinine proteins rather. In the second case, you see a dermal distribution of this painful rash with vesicles and multiple stage of healing, and this have, may have been preceded by burning and itching. This is uh, shingles or varicella zoster virus, and it can affect the V1 component of the trigeminal nerve for ophthalmic involvement. If it crosses the midline, then you should check for HIV or, or an immunocompromised state. This next case we have hairy leukoplakia on the lateral tongue. Um, you can't scrape it off, and this occurs in HIV positive patients. This is caused by Epstein Barr virus. It's hairy leukoplakia, and the scraping differentiates hairy leukoplakia from uh, candidiasis. Next, we have molluscum contagiosum here. You can see kind of those um, umbilicated papules, and that's caused by pox virus. Treatment of, po of molluscum involves uh, observation. Typically, these resolve after a few years. You can do cryotherapy or cantheridin, which is blister beetle juice. Essentially, you want the body or the immune system to recognize the pox virus as a uh, as a foreign virus and begin to attack it. Here we have some hyperkeratotic papules on the sole of the foot with some telangiectasias following scraping. So these are warts and it's, they're caused by uh, the HPV virus. And you can differentiate warts from corns because corns don't have that telangiectasia with the scraping or those seeds. But the virus enters through uh, skin abrasions, and it's from the low-risk HPV strain. Continuing on with our rapid review of skin infections, we're moving on to bacterial infections. So here we have an ulcerative dark lesion that extends into the dermis. Let's say this patient is hospitalized with an unknown bacteremia. This is ecthema gangrenosum from Pseudomonas species, and it's associated with bacteremia. You want to obtain a gram stain and culture and maybe even biopsy the lesion for both A and E, H and E and culture. Pseudomonas can also cause otitis externa on the ear and can cause a hot tub folliculitis following hot tub exposure. Next, let's say a patient with a past medical history of cirrhosis got cut while boating and now has cellulitis and bolus lesions. This is may be caused by Vibrio vulnificus, as we talked about earlier. And Importantly, Vibrio vulnificus affects patients with uh, like liver like with liver issues. So this patient has cirrhosis, and I believe the earlier context in which we talked about Vibrio vulnificus infection was with hemochromatosis. Next, we have a patient that got in a motorcycle accident and now presents with fever, chills, diffuse erythema with dusky skin, tenderness out of proportion, and crepitus. So this is necrotizing fasciitis and it's usually a polymicrobial infection, and treatment will involve debridement and broad-spectrum antibiotics. You want to include clindamycin, which is a 50S uh, inhibitor, because that will both cover for clostridium species, like clostridium perfringens, and also inhibit production of uh, toxic proteins. Next, we have a patient with a painless genital ulcer that now has deforming scarring of the face. Biopsy reveals granulomatous lesions with a necrotic center and spirochetes. This is 
syphilis, and this patient has gummas, which are those granulomatous lesions with the uh, deforming scarring. The initial painless genital ulcer is called a chinker. Some other findings you may see are Argo Robertson pupil, Tabes dorsalis, and late findings are CNS involvement, which is neurosyphilis. So more bacterial skin infections. So let's say we have a well demarcated erythematous superficial skin lesion that had rapid onset. The patient has a fever, and you can see that lesion here. This is erysipelas. And the most common cause is from group A strep. Now we have a patient with a fever, lesion with flat edges that's poorly demarcated and feels like deeper dermal involvement. This lesion is pretty tender and it's a unilateral. This is cellulitis. And the most common cause of non purulent cellulitis is group A strep. And the most common cause of purulent cellulitis is MSSA or MRSA. So the, really the best way to differentiate cellulitis and erysipelas that I could tell is how well demarcated the lesion is and how deep the infiltration is of the infection. Now some high yield bug bites. So this first bug bite, let's say there's a 40 year old male with a pruritic rash with pustules, erythematous papules involving the web spaces, as you see here, the wrist and the palms. He has several family members with similar symptoms. Let's say you do a prep with mineral oil and you see that little guy right there. So this is scabies, and it's caused by uh, Sarcopides scabii. And the diagnosis, you want to look clinically for burrows. You might need a magnifying glass for that. And then you want to do a scabies prep. So you can see here you see the mites, but you, often you see the ova or the eggs. After you scrape, scrape the skin and place it on mineral oil. To treat, you want to use topical permethrin or oral, oral ivermectin and you want to treat all household members prophylactically with topical permethrin and you also want to carefully wash all the bedding in the home let's say you have so for the next case we have a six-year-old boy with intense pruritus excoriations over the scalp and neck his he has other classmates with similar symptoms on the right here you can see some eggs in the hair and an organism in the hair. This is most consistent with lice, which is caused by pedunculus, and body lice, which are not the same as this hair lice, can transmit uh, rickettsia prozaki, which is endemic typhus. And that's just kind of a tangential high yield fact. Treatment is with ivermectin lotion, knit combing to remove the eggs, and uh, malathion. Next, we have a 25 year old gentleman in a homeless shelter that has pruritic papules in a linear pattern, erythematous papules with a hemorrhagic punctum. And you may see this organism here. So this is consistent with bed bugs caused by Simex, Lectularis. Treatment is with control of the pests and symptom management, usually with uh, antihistamines or a calamine lotion to, re um, to reduce the symptoms. Lastly, we have uh, patient that presents with a rapidly ulcerating necrotic wound. He also has some malaise and anemia on his foot. He recently came back from his cabin and wore old boots. So this is most consistent with brown recluse spider bite. And here on the bottom image, you can see a brown recluse spider. And it's caused by the sphingomyelinase D toxin. And treatment is supportive, but they will also often require wound cares. So more bug bites, let's say uh, your patient comes in, 20 year old, that went camp camping last week in Door County. That's a place in Wisconsin where it's a common hiking destination or camping destination. And now they have this targetoid lesion that's very annular and has a central clearing. And it looks kind of like a bullseye. So this is very common. This is erythema chronica migrans, which is a manifestation of Lyme disease. The vector is the Ixodes tick or, uh, and the Borrelia species. And I included here that if patients are bit by uh, Ixodes tick, then if they've been bit for, if they've been bit for longer than 36 hours, then you want to initiate prophylactic doxy, assuming there are no contraindications. This tick also co um, 
carries anaplasmosis and babesiosis. There are some other targetory lesions that we've covered that are associated with infectious disease, and those include tinea and erythema multiforme. Treatment of Lyme's disease is with doxycycline, and I believe the new, regulate, the new guidelines are that even in pregnant patients, we still use doxycycline because it's the best treatment for all, basically all tick-borne illness, including, including anaplasmosis. But babesiosis is more like uh, it's a parasite, so that would be treated with anti-malarial medications. Here we have a 60-year-old woman with pitting edema of their bilateral lower extremities with erythema, pruritus, purpura with brown hemosiderin deposits and some overlying scale. This is most consistent with stasis dermatitis, which is secondary to venous insufficiency. The pathophysiology of stasis dermatitis begins with irritation of the dermis, and that's because of extravasation of fluid uh, from the blood vessels to the extracellular fluid, which can be very irritating. And you can also have extravasation of proteins and red blood cells. Patients may develop lipodermatosclerosis, which is kind of the end stage of stasis dermatitis. And this is that would be irreversible. In patients with venous insufficient, they typically develop ulceration at the medial malleolus. And treatment of stasis dermatitis includes compression, so compression stockings. And the acute phase of stasis dermatitis with the extreme pruritus can be treated with uh, topical steroids. An important clinical pearl of stasis dermatitis is that if there's bilateral stasis, bilateral changes and erythema, it's more likely to be stasis dermatitis rather than cellulitis because cellulitis usually wouldn't present bilaterally. Confirmation of stasis dermatitis can be done with ultrasound. Now quickly going over burns. So there's different classifications of burns. So a superficial burn involves only the epidermis. So these will blanch and will be painful. Superficial partial thickness burns involve the epidermis and some of the dermis. And these also blister are painful and are blanchable. Deep partial thickness burns involve the epidermis and some of the dermis. And these are non-blanchable or painless, but they still perceive pressure. And that's because there's disrupted blood flow and nerve damage. Full thickness burns involve the epidermis and the entire dermis. But, and these are non-blanchable, non-painful, and may have that leathery appearance, but still perceive very deep pressure. But essentially, there's been so much nerve damage and vascular damage that you won't observe the blanching or the, uh, have the pain sensation intact. The rule of nines in burn is important to determine the um, distribution of the burn and know how much of the body is involved with the burn. Treatment of serious burn involves escherotomy uh, to reduce the risk of compression or of uh, compartment syndrome if there is a circular involvement of the burn. IV fluids, especially lactate ringers, infection prophylaxis topically testosterone sometimes in the burn units and PPI to minimize the development of ulcers. And these patients should be admitted to the burn unit for serious burns. So some more systemic diseases in dermatology or systemic disease associations. So let's say we have a 25 year old woman who just came back from Arizona that is now presenting with multiple two centimeter tender erythematous nodules along the bilateral anterior shins. So this is consistent with erythema nodosum, and this patient in particular may have coccidioides infection, which more commonly causes erythema nodosum than histoplasma, although uh, many infections can cause erythema nodosum. This is also associated with IBD, inflammatory bowel disease, sarcoid, other infections, and malignancy. The pathophys of erythema nodosum is a paniculitis, which is essentially uh, inflammation of subcutaneous fat following a robust immune response. It is important to note that about over 50% of erythema nodosum is actually idiopathic, so we never actually determine a cause for the erythema nodosum. Here we have, um, let's say that you have a little bit of medical history that there's a 40-year-old female 
with the BMI of 35 that has irregular menstrual cycles and you can see kind of that thickened hyperkeratotic plaque on the flexor neck. This is acanthosis nigricans and in this case this patient may have PCOS. Acanthosis nigricans is associated with increased melanin granules and is associated with insulin resistance but also may be associated with malignancy especially gastric adenocarcinomas. And the reason that these patients develop hyperkeratosis with insulin resistance is because keratinocytes have an IGF receptor, which causes acanthosis. Let's say a patient has a large painful ulcer over the shin with these violaceous borders or maybe gunpowder borders. And this patient has also had several months of loose stool. So this is pyderma gangrenosum. Importantly, you don't want to further traumatize the area in pyderma gangrenosum, so you should avoid excision of this area. This is associated with inflammatory bowel disease. And then multiple skin tags here are associated with insulin resistance, pregnancy, or also perianal Crohn's. And the main one you want to think about is, is insulin resistance for the board exams. Severe seborrheic dermatitis, which we covered earlier, is also associated with HIV and also neurodegenerative disorders like especially Parkinson's disorder. Here we have a slide about xerosis. So let's say we have a patient with xerosis scaling hyperlinearity of their palms and soles. That's worse in the winter. They have a family history of similar symptoms and atopy. This is ichthyosis vulgaris, which is named based on the resemblance to fish scales. This is a mutation in the filaggrin gene and is autosomal dominant. And again, the filaggrin gene is important to maintenance of the epidermal barrier. The pathophysiology involves defective desquamation of the keratinocytes and treatment is with emollients, uh, keratolytics like topical urea and topical retinoids in severe cases, which can also be keratolytics. Refsum disease can also present with, xerose, with ichthyosis and is an alpha oxidation defect and they will also have a shortened fourth toe. This is kind of a step one, a step one fact, but refsum, which you want to contrast with Zellweger's disease, uh, is because of an alpha oxidation defect. Treatment xerosis involves humidifiers as well lukewarm water, mild soaps, avoiding fragrances, and using ointments, especially in the winter. A few rapid review questions that, uh, a few rapid review lesions that are especially common with aging. So the first one here, you see these bright red cherry spots. These are cherry angiomas, and these typically affect older adults. You wanna contrast these with another vascular lesion you can see more in infants. This is an infantile hemangioma and this affects uh, infants and may demonstrate rapid growth prior to involution, which typically occurs around 18 months. Um, stra infantile hemangiomas are sometimes called strawberry angiomas. Here we have a solar lentigo, which is a brown spot. Um, you may, I believe these are the same thing as liver spots, but they're um, benign melanocyte proliferation in sun exposed areas. And on the bottom right, we have solar purpura, may also be called senile purpura, which is secondary to bruising in the skin. And this will be non-blanchable. Essentially, as, as we age, we have more atrophy of the skin and easier bruising. Quickly going over alopecia. So the phases of alopecia, the phases of normal hair growth are the antigen phase, which is characterized by hair growth, the catagen phase, which is characterized by hair regression, the telogen phase, which is the resting phase, and the exogen phase, which is shedding of the hair. So the mnemonic I have is ACT electric for antigen, catagen, telogen, exogen. And here's a van der Waal generator, which causes your hair to stand up due to the electrical current. And you can I use that to remember the ACT electric acronym. So antigen effluvium is when you will have more fragile hairs and hair, more hairs will skip from the antigen to the telogen phase. This can occur uh, typically with chemotherapy. In telogen effluvium, which is very common, follicles exit the antigen phase too early, 
which cause thinning and also synchronous hair growth. So a few months following trauma, something like a surgery or delivery of pregnancy, patients will notice hair loss and they'll notice that when they're in the shower, they may lose a lot of hair or something like that. And on the hair pull test, the hair shafts are easily pulled out. Typically, this will resolve spontaneously. So the treatment is typically reassurance and observation, but you can also obtain testing, which is routinely done clinically, but may not be routinely done on test examinations. But in the clinic, we also obtain a thyroid and iron levels as well and a blood count. But on the exams, you usually just want to pick observation and reassurance and watch for observation. So let's say we have, staying along with our alopecia topic, let's say we have an African-American woman with alopecia, re review of systems is positive for pruritus, and on exam you see scaling plaques with associated alopecia and post-auricular lymphadenopathy. This is, here's an image of that. And this is tinea capitis. If you fail to treat tinea capitis, it will result in permanent hair loss. So you'll want to do both a KOH scrape and a culture for fungal elements uh, for tinea capitis, but you really want to treat with a systemic antifungal. So that will be either oral, oral griseofulvin or terbinafine. You want to avoid or topical antifungals are not enough because you want to treat very aggressively to prevent permanent hair damage. And because the dermatophyte can affect the hair follicle and have deeper infiltration, a topical agent wouldn't be enough. So tinea capitis, treat that with a systemic antifungal agent. Now moving on, let's say we have a patient with patchy alopecia has sparse eyebrows, hair is of varying length, and they have a history of anxiety and OCD. This is an image of the patchy eyebrows, and this is most consistent with trichotillomania. And the diagnosis will involve shaving a hair, a window for hair growth, and hair growth will be uh, shaving a window, and hair growth should be equal within this window. Treatment will involve uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and SSRIs, but trichotillomania can often be difficult to distinguish from alopecia areata, but the eyebrows and the window shave test can be uh, good diagnostic tools. And essentially, trichotillomania is patients pulling out their hair. Here we have a very common uh, condition, 55-year-old gentleman with alopecia and thinning of the of the hair at the vertices and crown on microscope or a magnifying glass or dermoscopy you observe miniaturization which is essentially you get uh, thinner hair follicles at the base so this is androgenic alopecia or male pattern baldness which is mediated by androgenic activity especially 5-DHT which is dihydrotestosterone and again it usually starts uh, affecting the crown and the vertices and begins as thinning. Treatment involves topical or oral minoxidil, oral or topical finasteride, which is a 5-DHT blocker. Women may also use OCPs and spironolactone. And our last alopecia case, we have a 45-year-old woman with a past medical history of adrenal insufficiency, Hashimoto's hypothyroidism presenting with alopecia. On exam, you find a well-defined circular alopecia with a positive exclamation point sign. This is alopecia areata, and you note that there's a very well-defined circular affected area of alopecia. And what's very high yield to know, again, is that alopecia areata is the autoimmune mediated destruction of hair follicles. So this will be associated with other autoimmune conditions. And in the exclamation point sign, essentially hairs um, appear to be floating because of the narrowing of the shaft and loss of pigment near the scalp. Again, the hair pull test will be positive. You'll have five or six hairs extracted. And treatment involves typically intralesional steroids, so injected Kenalog, or, which is triamcinolone. And patients may consider topical immunotherapy in extensive disease. But again, treatment is ultimately up to the patient. So some miscellaneous, our last slide, 
is a 22-year-old African-American gentleman that presents with these painful papules and pustules with follicular involvement beneath the chin and neck. Here we have an example of those painful papules and pustules. This is pseudofolliculitis barbae, and treatment involves use of a single-blade razor and then warm compresses before shaving. Tightly curled facial hair in particular is more prone to uh, pseudofolliculitis barbae because this condition is essentially caused by penetration of the hair shaft into interfollicular skin. So basically the hair will repenetrate the skin, which will cause some inflammation. And that will do it. So that will complete our talk and our video on dermatology. I hope you learned something. Please leave a, a comment with any suggestions and look in the description for the slide deck and the Anki cards. And please like and subscribe if you, if you enjoyed. Thank you so much.